Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I am your host, Scott Bernstein, along with my co-conspirator, partner in crime, the doctor, Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. And we got Ben uh, behind the glass on the wheels of steel, our producer, our MVP. Uh, ben, how you doing? Doing well. So uh, today we are going to bring back the quintessential original gangsters OG. And I say that because this individual, not only was he a major figure in organized crime uh, on the East Coast in the 2000s, um, he was a boss by the time he was in his early 30s. Uh, Anthony Benji Arrelata, uh is going to join us. He was our first ever interview when we started this podcast. I think it was in 19, maybe the end of 18. Um, and we did about a half hour with him. And it, it wasn't the best quality. And people have been on our ass for two plus years to get him back. And hopefully this will be the first of, of uh, many more uh, collaborations. Anthony, thank you for joining us. What's going on, Scott? Thanks for having me on. What's up, Jimmy and Ben? Hi, Anthony. How are you guys doing? Doing well, thank you. Thanks for coming back on the show. Yeah, he was one of our first big he guests. He was our first. Yeah. We, we, might not have yeah. dro- we might not have dropped the episode first, yeah. but it was the first time that we recorded OG Podcast with me, you, and, and right. Roberto. Yeah, that's right. Our, that's right. And Jimmy was on it, right? That's when I yeah. first met. Right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, when I did that one, I was actually, when I had my first, like I, like I said, I never worked. It was the first job. I ever had in my life, but I was working at the car lot. So during that interview, when we got cut off short, they were calling me to come to the uh, showroom. And (laughs) that's why it probably abruptly ended the way it did. But uh, um, I was walking around the uh, the car parking lot while we were doing the interview. It was funny. (laughs) Yeah, everybody. We we took some heat. People were saying, why would you cut him off? Like that was a great interview. Yeah, you we're had like, him for we did, we, <laughs> we're like, why didn't you have him yeah. on for five hours? Right. We loved this. Right. You only gave us twenty five right. minutes. Yeah, it was like it wasn't our call. Yeah. <laughs> just the way it went down. But uh, just to well, just go ahead. Sorry, Anthony. Go ahead. Well, no, I was going to say that's why it abruptly ended because I was getting a loudspeaker. They were calling me, calling me, and and, and it's a legit, you know legitimate job. I was getting you know getting paid to call me. They didn't. You know, so I'm walking around my job and then they're calling me. So I, I had to go. So that was that. Yeah, this is Anthony's life now. We're going to talk. Um, uh, I'm not going to say a little bit. We'll talk about uh, a lot about um, his life back in the 80s, 90s and 2000s. Just to give people a quick synopsis. Uh, Anthony grew up in Western Massachusetts, Springfield, Massachusetts, which is like the uh the county seat, if you will, for the Genovese crime family in that area and uh, came up under some some real uh, big time mafia powers in his area. Uh, the uh, Scabella, uh, Scabelli brothers, uh, Frankie Skyball and his brothers and then Big Al Bruno. Um, and then eventually Benji became the boss. Uh, of uh, of Springfield, Massachusetts, reporting directly to the Genovese crime family. Um, but one of the reasons we wanted to bring him in today <laughs> is to kind of take some of this, uh, and this is something we love to do on the OG podcast, we take a little bit of old and we take a little bit of new and we, and we sprinkle it together. So uh, when he was on the street in the 90s and early 2000s, um, mostly in the early 2000s, he had uh, a pair of brothers with him that were, um, you know, his some of his top lieutenants, uh, Freddie and Ty Gius. And Freddie Gius' name has been all over the news in the last couple of years because according to the federal government, he is the person that murdered Whitey Bulger, the infamous Boston Irish crime lord, also a a, a very, very major cooperator with the government, put a lot of people in prison, was a child predator. Not a lot of people know that really, really bad guy. And on the, in the world of, of, uh, OC, there are, there are good, bad guys and there are bad, bad guys. And Whitey Bulger was a bad, bad guy and, uh, got transferred, uh, from a protection unit down in Florida, uh, into general population in a prison in West Virginia in October of 2018 and was murdered, uh, within about eight hours. And the government says that Freddie Gius did that. And there's nobody that can give more insight into Freddie other than maybe Freddie himself, uh, than, than Anthony. So Anthony, you know, let's just jump right in. You know, he, he, Freddie was, uh, indicted, uh, last week 
it's been a four year investigation. What was your, um, what was your take on, on what we're, what he's facing right now? He's facing, well, he's doing life. So, but the problem with that is when you, when you're doing life and you get, and you murder somebody, I guess the death penalty is on the table, you know? So I don't know if that'll go to that extreme because Whitey was such a bad guy. Um, but that's what he's, you know, other than that, it's, a, you know, it's probably a little wreck for him. He gets to come out of uh, jail, take a ride to the courthouse, go through a trial, you know, breaks up his little bit, a little bit. He's been, you know, get some. what is it, you know, I want your opinion on the fact that they kept him in solitary confinement for four years before they charged right. him. I mean, that right. just, that seems so above and beyond uh, the way things should be done. And, and I, I don't know what took so long. I don't know why you couldn't have charged the guy, you know, within a couple months, but they waited four years and they kept him, you know, in 23 hour lockdown, which mu must have been, you know, a living hell, you know, w w you obviously are at one yeah. point were very close with Freddie. I mean, yeah. how, how do you, how do you mentally, you know, cope with that? Well, he, they had an uh, agenda, the FBI, why they did that. They, uh, from what I was told and from what I'm hearing is they waited four years and, and it's not really unheard of. They could have waited forever, forever and yeah. kept them in, you know, under, under, when you're in the feds and you're under investigation, I've heard stories where guys were in there for 10 years. I mean, I know guys that were in there for the rest of their life. Some guys ended up dying in the hole and they were so dangerous. They never let them out. But uh, from what I'm hearing is that the feds will be ensued for that death. And I guess the cases are just coming to end. Uh, the Boulder family suing them. And they were waiting for that to play out before all this, I guess, discovery came out during this trial. Um, I don't know how true that is, but that's what I've been hearing. That's why they've been, they were, you know, stalling with it. Um, and, you know, the Bolger family was a powerful family, even though, you know, Whitey was a bad guy. He had a brother that was uh, a major political force. He was the most powerful um, politician in Massachusetts that wasn't the governor. That wasn't a Kennedy. Right. That wasn't a Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, you know, I, there's a big Irish population in Mass. So that way, the politicians, they're like gangsters. Um, and we all know that, but they were really powerful families. So when he got killed, the powerful people that they know, they still have connections within that on the uh, legitimate side. And so I guess they put a lawsuit in and that's what delayed the, uh, the indictment from what I was told. Um, but either way, he was going to sit in the hole. So whether they charge him or not, when you do uh, an act of violence, you go to the hole. When you do murder, you go to the hole. Murder, you're going to stay there a lot longer. Usually, they, uh, if they're not going to charge you, you're still going to stay in the hole. Like, if, say, they didn't charge him, they'd ship him to ADX and, you know, or, or um, you know, marry in one of the, you know, those places. Uh, and he would end up in the hole there. So he was going to go to the hole and stay in the hole for a long time. And his, he, they now were getting... This, Anthony, let me just interject one second. I'm sorry. His family was putting pressure on BOP and the prosecutor. I mean, his, his, uh, I know his daughter and some other, his brother, uh, or maybe it was his cousin. I don't, he, he, had, he was getting pressure, uh, or the, the government was getting pressure from the GS family. Right. And that's because Freddie, you know, they're not, they're getting pressure from the family because Freddie's telling them, obviously he doesn't want to be in the hole. So, you know, he, you know, he's like, you tell them to charge me or not. If you're not going to charge me, that means I'm not guilty of a crime. Then what am I doing in the hole? That, but if they call it, they're, it's under investigation and they can do that. Everybody says they can't do that. They can do whatever they want. So it's under investigation. They throw you in the hole. There's a lot worse they can do too. So um, the family, because Freddie doesn't want to be in the hole, of course, you know, so he's got his family support. The family's trying to, you know, put pressure to get him, you know, what are you guys going to do here? Charge him. If you're not charging him, then why is he still in the hole? And that's, uh, that's the pressure that they're getting from the family. And, you know, Freddie, obviously he wants to get out and walk around the compound and, you know, that's what he wants, but 
that's why the pressure was coming. He'll be greeted Nobody as a hero. He'll be in the hole. He'll be greeted as a hero in, in every prison that he's that he's in for the rest of his life. I mean, this is a guy. I don't know that, if he's going to be greeted like a hero. Listen, everybody, like, and I'm hurt, you know, I'm, I'm sure you heard stories. The penitentiaries are dangerous. And there's guys in there. I mean, there's stories you hear guys got their heads cut off, they get stabbed a hundred times, guards get killed. There's murders. They're serious, serious guys, and they're killing other serious guys. So, in under you know, among the penitentiaries, they're ch- they're killing guys that you know, other serious guys in different crews or different in the, within their own crew. That are you know, it's it's a it's a it's a dangerous. I don't know if people grasp how dangerous the penitentiaries are. I'm not talking about federal prison. I'm talking the the 13 penitentiaries that are that consist of the most violent criminals in the country. And it's, it's, it's in some places, uh, it's a war zone. So I don't know if he's going to get treated like a hero. I mean, the guy was 90 years old in a wheelchair. I mean, for notoriety status. Yeah. He's going to have a lot of notoriety that he killed the infamous Whitey Bulger. But, um, I think he would have, he would have been more of a, he he's a he's a legend throughout the world now. Let's say because of the of the notoriety that the detention that it's getting because of who Whitey Bulger was. But amongst that, inside that penitentiary system, that's just another murder, and it's an old man murder. That's you know the guy was in a wheelchair, so that's not. And he's never going to see a medium. He's going to stay at a penitentiary level. So, is he going to be treated like a hero amongst them? I don't think so. That's you good. Know, I mean, good he's going to be treated. He's going to be treated as with respect because of, of who he is, you know, but that's not really something that, you know, they look at that as like, there's guys, you know, there's guys in there that probably killed, you know, maybe three, four people inside the federal prison alone. There's guys in there. I was with guys that killed, you know, when, the, when those guys got indicted and there was like, they, they indicted them for like 25 murders, the Aryan Brotherhood with the brand in them. I mean, so. You know, those are the type of people that are in those high level penitentiaries and they're killing people. I mean, I don't know if you go if you hear these stories or you don't, but if you do your little investigation with uh, the penitentiaries, people are getting butchered in there. And if they don't get bit butchered, it's close to getting butchered. And so we're, we, you know, they might be on uh, uh, not be able to walk the rest of the way. So, or, you know, all kinds of bad things. Yeah, we did our episode with Seth Ferrante where he provides – he did, what, 27 years, 25, 25. years? He gives us a lot of insight. On a nonviolent, 25 on a nonviolent. Right. They just assumed he was a killer because his sentence was so was yeah. so stiff. But but he said that uh, you've got to click up right away, either with the Italians or the AB or the Latinos or whomever, the black dudes, whatever, or else you'll, you'll, you'll be in trouble. So Yeah, and if you're in a – it depends. If you're in a medium, I mean, that's true. You get, you're going to have to click up with – you know, whether you, you don't have to click up. I mean, you could be a solo guy, you know, that just goes in, you know, you're, uh, um, you know, you don't ride with no cars or you're riding with, you know, like say your areas car, they call it that. Like for me, for mass, if I didn't want to join like the white supremacy Aryan type groups, or, you know, there's white guys that join black gangs. There's white guys that join the bloods. They join, uh, there's, I guess in other prisons, the Crips, you know, there's white guys that join Latin Kings and, they got this uh, net guys, you know, and all these different Spanish organizations. Then you got the Mexican, you got a lot of different gangs. So when they come in and the reason they do that and, and a big point about Whitey getting killed is you have to police your area. So if I'm from Mass, Freddie was hanging around with the Mass guys. They call it the Massachusetts, the Boston car, they would call it because Boston's the bigger city. But it's, you know, it's Massachusetts guys. The Massachusetts guys would, would click with the New York guys. Those guys usually clicked with their own cars, but they all stuck together. And they were a dangerous force. Boston guys have a strong reputation in the federal system as the, the Boston car is like a, a serious car. They're well-liked guys. And um, so when a guy comes in, say it's a guy coming in from California and it's a white guy, well, the Aryan Brotherhoods or the white, I don't know what other white gang they got, would uh you know uh, confront him but someone's going to confront him and, and find out who this guy is if the, you know, they they want to see paperwork they want to know 
for fact that you weren't an informant at once, even once, or if, in a, let me tell you something, in a penitentiary, if you sat down with the feds and proper, you're getting butchered or you're getting, you're, you're getting told to get off the, uh, the compound. And if you don't, you're getting butchered, you're getting killed in a penitentiary. So when Whitey comes in, Freddie being with the Boston car, and I know stories too, I could tell you with Freddie in prison about situations that he'd been in with prisoners that were with him that are out now and that I'm in contact with, but uh, Freddie being in the Boston car, he's got to now, and they knew that Freddie, they, they knew that this guy came. I don't know if you saw. Yeah, it got leaked. Mother. It got leaked out. No, 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 no. It was the guy. Uh, they, I guess this guy was there. He was right across the, uh, the, the cell from when they went in and killed him. Did you see that? You know, Sean, that? Sean McKinnon. No, 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 no. There was a, there was a uh, Spanish kid from uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts. He's out now. Okay. He was directly across the cell from Fred, from Whitey Bulger. And this is coming from his mouth. He was there. He saw it. He, he saw them go in. He, he didn't say names, but he said they went in. They walked into the, they knew Whitey was there the night before. Yeah, I was gonna, because when, a, when the, when the bus comes in, they get word that who's coming in. So the right away, because the guards tell them, because they want to know where this guy's going to go. Is he going to be a New York guy, a Boston guy? Is he going to be a blood, a crib? They, they want to know, they want to try to keep peace there. And when the, so when he knew he, this guy knew that the uh, Whitey was there the night before and he's from Lawrence Matt, Matt. So he even said it. He said, oh, shit's going to pop off tomorrow with this guy because he knew Whitey and his past and he knew these Boston guys, they don't fuck around there. They got a serious car. So when so he said that he saw two guys walk in. They knocked them out cold right away. Hit them with the lock, knocked them out. Whitey was knocked out within three seconds. And then they went to work on him for 10 minutes and he said they did him filthy. He it gouges, it gouges his eyes out. Right. And then they threw him underneath, you know, they tried to clean up the mess. They went and took showers. And then right after breakfast, um, they lock everybody back in and the cop comes and does the round. And that's when they uh, locked the joint down. They found Whitey. It was a crime scene. And, and that's, you know, that's coming from a guy directly that was there. But Freddie being in the Boston car, they had to confront Whitey. Now, they could have went up to him and said, hey, Whitey, you don't even come out of your cell. Go back and tell them to, you're not coming in population. Then gave them that option. And, but they didn't. They just took it to the extreme level and they said, fuck him. And they went in there and murdered him. Anthony, do you think the government set him up? I mean, why was he in a general population unit to start with? He came from a protection unit down in Florida. Yeah, well, so I never believed in stuff like that. You know, like Jeffrey Epstein got killed. I never believed that, you know, he was murdered. I go, ah. but now the way I've been seeing things transpire in the last, and I've been investigating, doing my own investigation. Now I see, yes, that's very possible from what Whitey, and, and I have different takes on what Whitey did. Whitey corrupted law enforcement. He corrupted the FBI and he had more guys than the guys that got indicted, you know, a lot of guys died in the past and he had guys that were still living. He had guys that are, are older and retired, very powerful people. And, and he, and there was a lot more than just Connolly and Moritz. And uh, there was a lot of uh, Fitzgerald. There was a lot of um, organized crime state. There was a lot of federal uh, FBI agents. And there was also a lot of politicians. Don't forget dirty politicians. That, so, Yes, that's possible. I would say that's like a a 50-50 if uh, they wanted to do that to him and kill him. Because I'm going to tell you why it's 50-50. Because the reason he was there, I mean, we all know, I don't know if the audience knows, is he was at Coleman and he was treated like a king there. He was treated. You're saying, like Whitey, Whitey, you're saying Whitey. You're saying Whitey was. Whitey, Whitey Bulger was at Coleman uh, Penitentiary. Uh, and this place is housing. It houses regular inmates, serious inmates. But it also houses people that might have cooperated in the past or has some dirt on them. So it's kind of like they send them to Coleman. And when he was there, he got into an argument with staff, with the nurse, threatened the nurse. He said, I could have you killed. Um, you know, the, the nurse was busting his balls and he threatened her and they took him out of it. Now, if he didn't threaten the nurse, 
he never gets taken out of there. He never gets killed. So when they, when you, when you say that they sent him there to get killed, what if he never threatened a nurse? Do you think they would have took him out of Coleman and sent him there? No, they would have left him in Coleman and he would have died there. So that type of conspiracy, I don't think, I, I would think it's not, but once he did do that, now, it, now they have a chance. Now he opened the door and they could have said, now let's, you know, send them there. And, but here's another thing. He could have said, they asked him when he came in, did you ever, were you ever an informant? And he said, no. So he could have very easily said, I don't want to go to population. Yeah, but Anthony, isn't it the, <laughs> isn't it the facility's job to know who they have coming into their, uh, into their building? I mean, no, yeah, there, I mean, there were very few, his notoriety. there were yeah, very few absolutely. more infamous cooperators in the history of our judicial system than, a whole, than Jimmy a whole movie, Black right. Mass. I mean, there's two, I'm going to give you an example. Departed, uh, so would, Yeah, yeah. Departed wasn't that, though, with a, about the white. I mean, it was similar. I was to the, story, the character was loosely, him. yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But uh, when you go in there, no, this is true. I mean, you ever hear the story, guy, they released the guy by accident, he, you know, and, and mistake, and the guy got let out. I mean, they do make mistakes. When you go in there, they... If you sit in front of, uh, when you get there, yes, I know the big wigs and everybody should know it. And they say, why are you sending them there? But if the guy threatened the nurse and he's not in the witness protection program, where are you going to send them? He's going to a higher level. You know, yes, they did fuck up by doing that. Um, but they do ask you them questions like, do you, are you okay to go to population? And if you say no, they put it down. They don't care. They don't care if you get killed or, or, you know, and a lot of people like say the staff, when he came in in West Virginia, they probably don't know who he is. I'm talking the uh, intake, right? Like they see this old guy coming and they probably don't know, you know who that is. That's the infamous Whitey Bulger. He's this, is it. So, and, and, and obviously they're doing their job. Their job is intake. Were you an informant? No. Okay. Do you have any problems with anybody? Yeah, means no. Okay. Boom, boom. Boom. Go ahead. Process them. Get him in there. Now, somebody still should have been, you know, eventually, like in other words, they, okay, here's my point. They would have probably caught it, but they caught it too late. Like the next day when they found out, are you kidding me? Whitey Bulger's in population, close those things down, lock everybody down, boom, and they would have moved them out. But I think, it, you know, it just happened so fast they didn't have that chance. And there's a lot of guys, like you pointed out, there's a lot of guys from New England that are housed in that Hazleton facility uh, in, in West Virginia. So it's kind of known as a place where Boston runs the yard or runs part of the yard. So it also kind of makes people scratch their heads that out of all the prisons to transfer him to and put him into a gen pop unit. Uh, well, why, why would you send him to an area or a facility that had a lot of guys from Boston that would know who right. it was? Boston has a deep car there everywhere. There's not a federal prison. I think or, that there exists, that there isn't a Boston car in it. So explain so, it. But, but, Go ahead, Anthony. No, go ahead. I was going to say, explain to people uh, the difference between the group that you were with um, in, in Springfield, Massachusetts, which was a wing of the Genovese crime family, one of the five New York mafia families, and then the traditional organized crime group in New England, which is the Patriarcha crime family, which is kind of based between Boston and Providence. But there's this other group that, that Anthony was in charge of. Uh, like we said, at a very young age, by 32 years old, he was he was running that whole area of the state. Um, but let people know the difference between the group that you were with and then the traditional OC in that area. Well, there's no difference. We're all traditional OC, gangsters, mafia, all together. It's just two different families. One family is out of uh, Providence and Boston, Eastern Mass. And Western Mass is, it, you know, it's the same thing. It's like, why is the patriarch is in Boston? Well, why is the Genovese family in Springfield? I mean, they branch out and they just happen to branch out in the Connecticut, mostly Springfield. It was all Springfield. But, we, you know, our crew in Springfield filtered and did business all throughout Connecticut, all going into Albany, all throughout Eastern uh, Central Mass. We had a big care, you know, going into Rhode Island. So it's basically the same thing. It's just back in the day when say one of the older guys that were around Vito Genovese or Lucky Luciano, even way back then, those are, that's considered the Genovese family, Frank Costello. One of those guys relocated to 
Western Mass area or, you know, and then, you know, he started, it's just like, why is they, why do they go to Florida? They start living in Florida. And the next thing you know, they start bring, you know, building a crew down there. And then next thing you know, they start making guys down there. And then next thing you know, it's the, it's the, it's a faction of the Genovese family down there. Same thing. Only this happened in the early 1900s instead of, you know, later on, you know, so th- that's why the Genovese family was a, uh, a dominant force for a long time here. And it was just a wing off of it, like you said, but it, it's all the same. We're all connected. There's no difference from a made guy. Um, there's made guys that were in this area that were just as notorious, probably murdered more people than the mafia bosses in New York, but you don't hear about them because they never get the press like New York mobsters get. Yeah, just for and, people for people to know, the Springfield crew was no Mickey Mouse crew. I mean, this was, and I mean, maybe even today we we can discuss where they are today. But when when you know from the early 20th century to when uh, Anthony ended up uh, going to prison in 2009, uh, that was a very dangerous, uh, profitable, respected. Yeah group of regime that was respected nationwide. You just, people wouldn't think of it when they, when they think mob, they think New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, they don't think Springfield mass, but Springfield right. mass had a very formidable group. Yeah. If you call, I don't know how you start like um, a Mickey Mouse or something like if you, if you shed light on Springfield, you're shedding light in New York. They're one in the same. A Genovese family member is that's it. He gets to respect no matter where he goes. So there's no difference than a made guy in Springfield are made people might think that but they're all the same they're one in the same yeah new york is the five families they have so many more soldiers and associates because they have so many more people in new york city but per capita amongst the people that we have here well there was an article that was written that said we have more per capita and you can do the work on that one um, michelle mcphee wrote that in 2006 in the boston herald she in January and she wrote that um, Springfield per capita has more made guys and associates than any stronghold in the country, including the Bronx and Brooklyn. And that's public. She wrote that. So, I mean, we, we had so many, you know, through Connecticut, too, don't forget you got um, another family patriarchs when they got arrested in the nineties, there was like 20 of them made guys that were, that got arrested. And so when you combine the patriarchs, you know, it's the same thing if you go to New York. You got the Columbos, you got the Genovese, you got the Gambinos. Well, it's the same thing here. You got the Patriarchs, you got the Genovese. So just because they're a different family, we're still all made guys and our presence. And we get along with the Patriarchs, so we treat each other respectfully. And we all get treated like kings. We all, they lay down the red carpet for us, especially, the, you know, in our areas, we get treated like royalty. You know, you know, especially the old timers, but even with me, when, when I was running around, you get treated like a king. So there's no, it's all one and the same. It's just New York, big empire state building, big cities, five families, you know, I don't know how many people, millions of people, 10 million people there. All right. So you, you, you cut that in you, you, uh, 10 times you know, less and then, but it's still per capita, the same here. And then when you, when you, it's it's and if you had to tell me would I want to be made in New York, or which I got made in New York, but if I want to be in a crew in New York or a crew here, I take this, take this or in a heartbeat. I, I wouldn't want to go in New York because you now you're you got so much competition. Here we have it all. And you guys would also work with non Italians, right? I mean, obviously they wouldn't be made guys, but like someone like Freddie, uh, I don't believe he's, he's Italian. Greek. He's Greek. And so, uh, right. how 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 would like Italian guys like you meet the non Italians just from being on the streets or meet met each other in prison or how how does that work? Right. Well, that's always been uh you know all the out you know different cities Chicago New York and everything always did business they did you know business with the Jews they did business with uh you know black gangsters money money business wise um but a lot of them if you go back and in history, a lot of the dangerous guys that were with the mob, they were just like made guys, you know, they were just as feared and just had as much respect, but they just never were formally inducted into the family. So that exists. Number one, um, when you're on that level, like if, if my guys here murdered somebody with me, they're going to get treated 
sometimes even better than a made guy that didn't have the balls or the crew or the capability of killing somebody. So that's going to exist. The other ethnic, ethnic groups that we bring in, yeah, a lot of it has to do, well, it's not just prison, but a lot of things with drugs came out now. So who are you going to be dealing drugs with? Like with me, marijuana, I dealt with a lot of Jamaicans. I, I, I had great friendships with them. I was huge in the marijuana business. Cocaine, you, you might be dealing with some Colombians. I dealt with Colombians. So you're going to interact more than the old timers did because of the drug issue. Um, we also interact with uh, Spanish gangsters because it was a big number business. We interact with black gangsters and, you know, you call them black gangsters. They didn't really have a, uh, a name for who they were, but they were black gangsters. We had a, we had the black number business and we had a Spanish number business. When I took over, I, I combined them both. But so you're always, into, listen, money knows no color. You're going to, you're going to be with anybody where you can make money with. And as times evolve and you start making money, you're going to start making money with any, you know, Chinese. We did business with Chinese. Bruno used to have me meeting bosses in the uh, Boston area of the Chinese. Uh, I don't know what they called their uh, organization. The tri- the China, organization. Chinatown mob or whatever. Yeah. yeah are those triads yeah, yeah, there? Official triad? Yeah, group? something like that. Yeah. And I'm telling you, they, they were just, when we went to Chinatown and then we went to their rest, I mean, they were treated just like a mafia boss that gets treated. They, uh, they had these, you know, the underlings, they had people, you know, giving them all kinds of respect, you know, same thing. If you went to a restaurant for the Italian, we went to the restaurant, his restaurant, and he was treated like a King. So they had that. So yeah, you're going to interact with all, especially, you know, as times move down, you're going to interact, um, with any, any ethnic, uh, race, but, uh, to be formally inducted. No, that's, uh, that wasn't happening. Which I think that should have happened as times went on, evolved now too, because you know what's wrong with uh, you know if you, if you keep it as an organization, you got to move on with the times, and there's less and less Italians that are capable in that life. So you got to bring other type of ethnic ethnic groups in. So that's why you see it deteriorating. There's no talent out there for the young kids because you know it just it, it doesn't exist. Yeah, that's something we've talked about with with other guys. Um, we talked about it with the uh, reporter in New England, Tim White. Is that yeah. uh, that that yeah, uh, he was out Island, of Providence? Yeah. yeah, yeah, but just yeah. similar. I mean, New England that um, they're just the 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 talent pool is shrinking of <laughs> full blooded Italian guys. It's just uh, Italians yeah. have assimilated and they go to college and they do other things and and so <laughs> they're just they're just not the talent pool is is shrinking. Why do you think like well, like where do you where are the most hardened criminals coming up from they're coming up from neighborhoods that are in you know poor neighborhoods or back in the day the italians came over from italy they lived in the same neighborhoods that these poor kids live in today so you had a a neighborhood like a stronghold of all young and it was a neighborhood that they were all together yeah how did meyer lansky and lucky luciano meet each other because they grew up in the same neighborhood the jews and the italians grew in right Right. And, 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 and you're going to recognize somebody like, like you just said, he was Jewish. He was Italian, but they were the same. Like when you talk about Meyer Lansky, he was considered, you know, he had as much respect as a guy like Lucky Luciano, or even though Lucky Luciano was the official boss and he was the official, you know, made guy in the family. But Meyer Lansky had just as, you know, he had the respect and the same. So, so just as, um, Freddie G is now is kind of emerging in the, in the global headlines and becoming quite infamous outside of Massachusetts. Let's kind of go back and, and, you know, Anthony, tell us first of all, how you met Freddie and his brother Ty and what was their reputation in Springfield before they went to prison 12 years ago? So Freddie and Ty were like, I didn't know them growing up in my early, you know, when I went to prison. So my whole teens up until I was, I went to prison at 20. I never knew them. Um, I knew their cousin, um, but I never knew them, the girl cousin. But, but anyways, uh, they were regular kids. They came from a family. They worked, they, they had nothing to do with crime. They did not have no affiliation with organized crime. Their uncle owned a jewelry store. Freddie used to work there. And there was no affiliation with, them in organized crime. Ty went to prison 
we both went at a young age. I think he was 18. I was 20. And uh, 1989. And then, you know, 1990, we got stuck in the same uh, Concord State Prison. And his family told him I was there. He came up to my window. And he, he I, I had a cell that outlooked the yard. So if you were going to the, uh, the um, to go eat at the uh, rep to Chowhaw, when you left, he could come up to my window. So he knocked on my window and that's how he introduced himself. And that's how we first met officially me and Ty. And then we just started hanging out there. We started working out together and it was kind of funny cause he was just like a, he, he was just like nothing to do with the crime. I mean, he was a wild, crazy kid. Don't get me wrong. He was a, he was, um, uh, just like a, a young, tough kid. But he, it wasn't criminal. He was in there for getting into a fight and shooting a machine gun. And, you know, he was, a, you know, just a young, wild kid that used to fight, but nothing to do with money. When we got in there, me and him, you know, we had, I had big plans now because I was learning from the older guy who we were in serious state prison. So, and we never considered it serious. I mean, we were fucking around and having a blast in there, but I had big aspirations when I got out about, you know, I wanted to get into marijuana. This, I wanted to do this. I was, I knew gangsters, time gangsters. So Ty liked the way I was thinking it. Now, again, we were always in trouble in there and we got warned by the uh, administration. Next time either one of you is getting trouble, you're going to the, uh, we're shipping it out. We're sending you to the max. So we were fucking around one day in our unit and uh, something happened and he ended up beating up this Spanish kid and they shipped him out to uh, Walpole, made a serious, uh, super, you know, it was just a maximum security prison. Guys were getting killed there all the time in the seventies, early eighties. Um, and it was a dangerous place. And like I said, it was a, uh, a place where it wasn't dominated by blacks or Spanish. It was equally the same whites, I think had more whites there than there was black and Spanish. I mean, it was a, a white dominated, dangerous place. A lot of Italians, a lot of Irish, so he got sent there and something happened with a disrespect by the guard and he hurt the guard real bad. He beat him up and then they beat him up. And then he did it. He was, I got out in February of 91. He was supposed to get out in March of 91. Instead, he didn't get out until 95. They kept him in the hole for four years because he really hurt the guard body. The guard had to retire after the beating he gave him. So uh, I never seen him again on the street. I mean, we used to talk. Uh, you know, they give him phone calls once in a while, but I never saw him until he got out on the streets. I think it was in 90 and then 95, 96. And then you met so Freddie, he, you met Freddie through him in 95, 96. Yeah. So I, no, no, I met Freddie. Freddie used to come and visit him. You know, Freddie, Ty's family used to come up and visit him and my family used to come up and on visits, we'd all be together. And that's how I met Freddie. That's, you know, and Freddie was, wasn't a criminal. I mean, Freddie did like, dumb criminal stuff like credit card stuff. And, you know, at his uncle's jewelry store, he would take the credit card numbers and, 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 you know, do them, them type of scams. He had nothing to do with street crimes. And even his whole life, Freddie wasn't a, nothing to do with organized crime type crimes. He wasn't nothing to do with that growing up the whole time. I mean, he, Freddie was more of into rob, we robbed uh, hijacked trucks. He, he was down for that robbing people. He was down for that, you know, um, robbing drug dealers. He was down for that, but, uh, he didn't have nothing going on with the street crimes, you know, until later on when he was around me, I put him with, with stuff like that. But Freddie, I met in prison and the stories that we had in prison. I mean, it was like, you would have thought that we were in the best place in the world. I mean, we just had, so he, so he heard all these stories and, you know, he liked them and he, and, so when I got out, I hooked up with Freddie and me and him started hanging around little by little. We started, you know, I did so many things when I'm like, we, like I said, we robbed trucks. We, we sold some cocaine. Um, so the, so did, wait, Anthony, started, let, me, let me stop you one second. Did you have to put him on record with Al Bruno as someone that you were vouching for? Absolutely not. In my life, I never put no, not one person on record in the mafia ever. Never. I never had done it. Never. So did, but uh, did, did put me on record, but I never put anybody on record. But were the, were the higher up 
you know, shot callers in the Springfield mob regime in the mid nineties, were they taking notice? I mean, obviously they were taking notice of you, but were they taking notice of Freddie and Ty? No, because Freddie and Ty were, were nothing. They were, I mean, they weren't, they it's like, listen, Freddie, Freddie and Ty were my friends. Right. And I did stuff with them. They were low, low, low. Well, first of all, Ty was in jail till 96, let's say, right? And so, so there's nothing there. And then Freddie, you know, he worked at it. A leg- Freddie worked at a legitimate job for his uncle. He had a wife, he had a kid and his wife dinner never wanted him with me. Freddie never went out. I was out every night. Freddie stayed home with his wife. You know, uh, Freddie had a kid. Freddie was living w- with his wife. You know, I went to his wedding and we were close like that. Freddie wasn't a criminal, you know? I mean, you know, we all know the story. I mean, when, it was, when I met him, he was working for his uncle. And before that, he was a prison guard at, in our area. So it's not like he was a criminal. He was the furthest thing from a criminal. I mean, he, no, he wasn't the furthest thing from a criminal. He was the fur, you know, furthest thing from an organized crime criminal like what we were doing. So, you know, he was just a, you know, a ballsy kid that was, you know, a ballsy kid. You know, when I say ballsy, I, he, we are the same. We're all crazy. When I, there's a lot of crazy kids, but we're like something wrong with us crazy. So he was like that. And he never did anything. You know, like I said, we hijacked trucks. Freddie was good at getting cocaine and say he got, we got a kilo of coke. Freddie would make five kilos of coke out of it. I mean, that's, that's how we would rob people. We'd give people like uh, mostly garbage and, you know, and charge them a kilo price. So he did that. Um, we, we, uh, if it was something that with a fight, he was right there. Like if I was out somewhere and there was anything with a fight, yes, he was right there. He was, he was violent, but I mean, he never shot anybody, never killed anybody, never did any of that. And then he ended up getting in trouble himself in 1995. I think it was around then 96. He got in trouble robbing a, uh, a truck with computers and he got indicted for that. So he went to prison. So there was no presence of Freddie in the underworld or amongst organized crime criminals. Now you got to figure Ty went to jail till 96 and he got out. So he's irrelevant. Freddie was legitimate. You know, like I said, he had a kid, then he had another kid and his wife used to, was all over him. I don't want you with Anthony or Lada. stay away from that little hoodlum. So he could never get out of the house at night. And so, so he was a daytime thief type criminal, you know? So he's not getting noticed by no, uh, no gangster, no nothing, none of that. Ty gets out of jail in 96. He starts getting involved with the marijuana. He lasted, I think, a year on the streets. Boom. He was getting marijuana from Arizona. And then he was getting it shipped. So one day the dog smelled or whatever. They went, you know, they set up a sting. And when the marijuana went to his house, they arrested him. He got four years for that. So Ty is irrelevant, totally nothing to do with organized crime because he was in jail till 96. He got out till 97. He went back in jail for four more years and didn't get out till 2001. See, I'm leading up to 2001. That's when, that's when they started becoming relevant. So then Freddie gets, goes to jail in like 96. He goes to jail for four years. He doesn't come out until 2001. So in the underworld, in the organized crime circles, they're not even like fucking a name that's even mentioned besides being friends with me and being in my crew. You know, like the guys that I hung around with, they know who Freddie and Ty is, my circle of guys. But other than that, you know, they don't know much about them. Like, that's what I'm trying to tell you. That but at a, like certain, nothing. at a certain point, him and, you know, as tensions are rising between uh, New York and Al Bruno, who had taken over from uh, Frankie Skyball and was a bit of a polarizing figure. And you're kind of on one side of the the fence. And even though Al Bruno was kind of a mentor of, uh, of yours, there, there, there are some issues there as the 2000s come. And at some point, and I want you to expand on this, at some point, Bruno gets into a physical altercation with Freddie. No. No? With Ty. But with that Ty. comes with later. So, okay. Yeah. So 2001... Freddie gets out of prison first and he starts coming around me and, but doing nothing at first, his brother gets out. What, 
what got the ball rolling with Freddie, Freddie was a, a, a laid back, like laid back dude. You know, if he had a certain amount of money, he wasn't like, he was okay with it. He didn't, you know, like he didn't have that. I don't know if it was greed, but he didn't have that mindset to say, I want to make a million dollars a year mindset. He was just, if you gave him some crumbs, he was happy with it. And he was just, you know, he was a ball buster. He was okay with it. Now come Ty. Ty was in jail his whole life since he's been 17 years old. So he comes out of jail at, in uh, 2001, he was in jail since 89, except for one year. And he was, in, and, and he beat up another guard when he was doing the four years from 97 to 01. So now he's, he did like seven years in the hole. That does a lot to your mindset. And, and, and he's a paranoid schizophrenic to begin with. So imagine sitting in a fucking hole for like seven years. I mean, you know what I mean? So he comes out. And I used to have him, I used to have dinners at my house every Saturday night. I used to have him over. I used to have his father over. I used to have like 15, 20 guys at my house Saturday night. So when he got, they, when they got out of jail, they were come over my house Saturday and he was just getting out. Okay. When Ty got out, he was just, his whole thing was he felt they were owed something him, you know, him, especially that these guys that were out here, not me, because that was their friend. But the, and I and they knew me. We done things together that proved to each other that we would take someone's life if we had to. So, but he said he knew these other guys that were made a lot of money. They weren't. They shouldn't. They didn't deserve that because this. Uh, he went to jail. Did some serious, dangerous things. Lived a lived a, a life that was pretty horrible. And now these guys are out. Never did a day in jail, making all this money, and they get treated with respect. So Ty came out with like that, I'm going to rob these type of guys. And he did. He started robbing them for major amounts of marijuana, small amounts of marijuana, cocaine, whatever he could rob them for, he did. And he made punks out of them. He made punk out of the kid Giuseppe Manzi. He made a punk out of him. And he robbed his cousin for a hundred and something thousand worth of weed. So he was making punks out of guys that thought they were gangsters. And I had nothing to do with this. And that's, you know, that's a lot of shit that was going on because, you know, people want to say like, because they were my friends that I was putting up to it or I was getting a piece. No, these guys came out of jail. Ty did. Freddie was more like laid back, hungry. They were broke. They had no money. So they were robbing everybody. I didn't, you know, I didn't care what they were doing. Go ahead, rob them. Just don't rob any of my guys that I'm selling weed with. And don't rob, you know, and don't cause any problems for me. But go ahead. If you've got a guy that's selling coke, rob him. And I would never take a, think about this. I'm a millionaire already, multi-millionaire. Am I going to take a piece of them money? The kid, they're coming out of jail broke. They rob a guy for 100000 You think I'm going to say, give me 10 or give me five or give me half? No. But I'll tell you, they gave Bruno 5000 out of it. Okay, so that's how they came out of prison in 01. So they start, and, kicking, up, they start kicking up to Big Al. No, no, no. I just gave an example. They gave 5,000. No, they never kicked up shit. To okay. Nobody. Yeah. No, no, no. Nothing. So when, when does Al put his hands on Ty? So what happens now is Ty gets out and uh, Ty starts dating this girl and he disappears. He's, he's living the family life. He's into construction and he's got nothing to do with me or the mob or anybody, his brother. I mean, he's, he's dating this girl. It happened to be a girl that I used to date, but he started dating her because I, you know, I, I had nothing to do with her anymore. And uh, they, they clicked up and they were starting to date and they were, you know, together. So six months go by and Ty is pretty much a worker and he's doing construction and that's it. Me and Freddie now, Freddie, and here's another thing. When Freddie got out, Freddie met some serious guys in prison that murdered guys and this and that. So you could tell Freddie liked that. Freddie was the type that wanted to be known as a, 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 a serial murderer, never mind just a murderer. He liked that, you know, he liked them stories. Like I said, when me and Ty were in prison at a young age, Freddie liked the stories that he was hearing from us. Yeah, we, we, we called the guy into the uh, basement and the, where the showers were, and we, we almost killed him down there and this and that. And then Ty, I used to torture Ty in there. And Freddie got a kick up out of all the stories. So, 
when he went to the prison and he got out in a one, he was around guys that were serious Boston gangsters and Worcester and, you know, you know, so he met a lot of guys and Freddie really liked that. He liked the fact that, you know, he could, he liked the stories when they told him what this guy killed three people and that. So when Freddie got out, he was, uh, I, I could go on so many different stories, but the, the thing is he started, he was around me more. I brought him around me more at the same time. Bruno's taking over as boss. Bruno gets promoted to boss in 2001. Um, when he does, I'm around Bruno. Uh, I'm one of his guys that he's proposing. Um, I'm all over the place now. I got a nightclub in, uh, Connecticut, the biggest one. I got half a dozen uh, restaurants. I got other, all kinds of businesses, joker, poker businesses. I got everything. They don't have nothing. Ty does Freddie doesn't have none. Ty doesn't have none. They were in prison. So I'm putting them with guys that I know. Like, here, this is this guy. He's in the weed business. Do business with him. I was setting them up so they could make money. I was giving them a piece of, of some of my legitimate business so they can make money. So I was helping them out how, how I could. So when Ty ends up coming back around, and at the time, there was a beef that happened. Victor Bruno is, is, is really not a nice kid. That's, That's Al Bruno's son. son. Yeah, he's not. He's, he's always been a, just a bad apple. And uh, extremely jealous type of a person. And so he was always jealous of me. He was always jealous of if I had a girlfriend, if I had a, a group of my crew of guys, he was jealous that I used to make tons of money. And, and he was it, always like that. So Freddie and him were friends also. So when Freddie got out in 2001, this is like, you know, a few months later, you know, right around 2000 and now, now we're into 2002, let's say Freddie had a, a guy out of the Boston area that was, uh, and I was well respected and they were doing knockoff Rolexes. Couldn't tell they were fake. Freddie was getting them for like 1500 a pop that he could sell them like 5,000, 4,000. I mean, you couldn't tell if they were fake. So he is the victor. Now Freddie ain't got two nickels to live together. He's coming out of prison and he's broke working for his uncle. He gives one to Victor Bruno, Victor Bruno, takes the watch and Freddie says, give me 3,500. So that's a score because the watch is worth so much more, but it's a fake. So it's really not worth it, but still you, nobody knows. So Victor takes the watch. He says, go ahead, take it get, you know, and take it for the weekend. Victor comes back and says he was at a valet that the watch got stolen. So now Freddie's got nothing, no money. He's got to pay the guy the 1,500, 2,000, something like that. So he tells Victor, Victor, I have to pay this guy. Can you at least give me the 2000 that I got to pay him? Which is, come on. He gave him the watch. What do you, you know, you lost it. Now, what do you want me to do? Like, that's your fault that you got stolen. So Victor paid the 2000 to Freddie. It was funny because we were at an Italian coffee shop in uh, near Springfield and Freddie owed me money. So when Victor gave him the money under the table, Freddie gave it to me under the table. So in Victor's head, he's probably thinking whatever he's thinking, I could give a fuck less, but you know, he, you know, it was just funny the way that transpired. So now Victor goes to his father and tells him what happened. And he explains it. Freddie tried to sell me a knockoff Rolex. It got stolen. And he made me, you know, Anthony, you know, it's Anthony's friend. And, you know, I had to pay him the 2000. So Bruno got enraged over that. He said, first of all, you know why Bruno got mad? Because he had no part of the scheme. Number one. OK, number two, now his son had to pay back for something. Be, you know, he's thinking, like, why did my son have to pay that back? I'm the boss and he should have just washed it off. So number two, he's mad at that. So we're, he beeps me on my beeper and he says, where are you? I said, I'm down at the club. He says he just happened to be there. He said, me, too. Now, he was out somewhere. He was in a limousine and he had too much to drink. He comes out of the club. Ty, we just came back from a restaurant. Ty's in the car next to me. I'm in my car. And Bruno comes yelling out, your, your friend Freddie's a scumbag. Your friend Freddie's a piece of shit. He robbed my son and I'm going to fucking, and Ty hears this and he says, don't call my brother a scumbag. My brother's not a scumbag. He says, yes, he is a scumbag. He goes up to the car, boom, he gives him a couple cracks. You're a piece of shit too. Now I know Ty, Ty's not, Ty's not put together uh, the right way. Okay. He's a delusional, paranoid schizophrenic type personality and he's a fucking ballsy. He's a dangerous guy. So I, me knowing this, I'm figuring that Ty's might get out of the car and 
kill Bruno because he's younger and better shape. And I'm also in a put in a bad position because I'm a proposed guy. I'm not made at the time, but let's just say Ty beats him up and I don't help. You no, know, they're going to say, well, what the fuck did you do? You know, maybe I could get killed over that. So that's how Ty ended up getting slapped around by, uh, like by Bruno. You, you was, know, was Victor a made guy at that no, point? The he never got made. Oh, he never. Okay. No, no. Victor was never considered. He was like, Oh my God. He was the furthest thing from a made guy that you could ever think of. This, this is really, this has been an amazing uh, conversation. And I want to tell our audience that I want to promise our audience that we will bring Benji back. Yeah. Uh, Anthony back very, very soon. Um, maybe even next week. We'll, we'll see how it works to, um, to flesh this out a little bit more. We're just kind of running up against time. It's a master class in but this New is great. England. This is great. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think we really got some perspective on, on the Gius brothers and Freddie, uh, just to give people um, another <laughs> little uh, nuggets of information that maybe you don't know. And we can get more into this in a, in a second interview that eventually tensions boiled over between Anthony and his guys and, Big Al Bruno, uh, where Big Al Bruno got on the outs with the New York guys and the New York guys, the, the boss of the Genovese crime family, even though Al was 30 years older than Anthony, they wanted to put their trust in Anthony. Uh, Anthony had proven to be not just a tough guy, but was an earner. And we know that that's not the easiest Combo, combination yeah. in that in that world. They recognized that, and they wanted to, you know, for you know, in essence, replace Al with Anthony. And there were some other issues with a guy named Felix uh, Trangisi who had gotten his hands on a, a FBI document that alleged, or it seemed to allege that. Uh, Bruno was was talking out of school to some FBI agents and was waving that around in New York. Word gets filtered back that Bruno's got to go. And again, we'll 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 devote a whole episode to this. But uh, Al Bruno was assassinated at his social club November 23rd, 19 or sorry, November 23rd, 2003. Um, and Anthony was involved in that conspiracy and then eventually replaced Al Bruno, but the Al Bruno murder, there hasn't been a ton of very high profile mob murders in the last 20 years. And this was, this is at the top of the list in terms, and not just in his part of the country. I mean, in America, the, the big Al Bruno murder from November of 03 is definitely one of the, <laughs> I dare I say highlights of, of the mob uh, in the two thousands. And I want to have Anthony back on to talk more about that. Yeah, uh, another thing I want to uh, and the G's and, the, and just so people to know, Freddie and Ty Gius are doing life in prison right now because of their participation in the Bruno murder. Another one of my favorite uh, moments when we talked to Anthony the first time, and people can go back and listen to that episode too. But um, it, it's actually it is a non sequitur; it has nothing to do with what you just talked about. But I loved it when we asked Anthony. Uh, what did you think when you first heard that Whitey Bulger was killed? And Anthony said, "They said." They told me Whitey Bulger was killed. I said, who gives a fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know hey, if you no, remember like, that, Anthony. Telling me for? Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. No, I, I, it's the truth. It's like, well, they're calling me up and saying, hey, you hear what happened? Whitey Bulger just got killed. I go, who gives a fuck? <laughs> what are you telling me for? Right, right. I remember that. that. was great. That was great. But, Anthony, this was great. I mean, really, this uh, your interviews have been maybe my two favorite that we've done uh, in three years. I want to do more stuff uh collaborations between OG pod and, and, and Anthony Arlotta and the brand that you're going to be building. Um, let any, let, you know, uh, why don't you let our listeners know our audience know where, where they can find you, anything you want to promote. And then again, we'll, we'll keep up this, this, uh, you know, this line of, of entertainment or content where we're kind of cross pollinating. Yeah, definitely. Instagram is my name, Anthony Arlotta, A R I L L O T T A. Same thing with Facebook. Um, I have a lot of new stuff that's going to be coming out um, that I'm in talks with now that's going to be really coming out more and more. And like uh, we were talking before, there's going to be a big um, podcast. It's going to be like, you know, a, an audio, but it's going to be all about, it's going to go into detail about the Springfield 
Connecticut, you know, all about the era, our era of uh, the mafia. And it's going to be detailed. It's, it's uh, the prosecutor on the case that handled the case. That was uh, the Elliot Ness version of the modern mafia prosecutors is putting it together. He's with Box Studios and Viacom Productions and, you know, he's with CNN and MSNBC. So it's going to be really well done. It's coming out first week of October. And then uh, the book that uh, my friend Joe Bradley was the, uh, is the author, that is um, the rough draft will be completed in November. And then it's being, right now it's being um, passed around to publishers. So a lot of good stuff coming out. And uh, so you'll be hearing a lot more of me in the near future. I mean, I'm telling you, I know Anthony and I talked about it a couple of years ago. I just didn't have the time or the financial capabilities to write his book. But if I had been given that opportunity, I man, I would have loved to, to sit down with Anthony and, and sketch out his whole life story because it's it's truly amazing. There are so many guys in this world that they live an amazing life compared to the regular Joe or Jane citizen. But it, it's it's very um, run of the mill for that, for that life. And Anthony, no matter what life you're talking about, has not lived a run of the mill existence and has really, uh, ambitious and charismatic. And like we said, someone that was, uh, all due respect, Anthony, a killer and someone that was a big earner and you could go very far, especially back in the 90s and 2000s. You could go very far uh, with those two attributes. And, and Anthony became a boss, like I said, at 2003 in his early 30s and, and led that uh, regime until uh, the late 2000s. I could see a TV show yeah. about Springfield because it's a little different than, you know, it's it's um, East Coast, which Hollywood likes, but yet not New York. And it's kind of that sweet spot. But it spot. still has a New York tie. Yeah, in. of course. Right, right. Which Which they would they would like. And so um, Cause that's another thing we can fun. talk about with Anthony. The next time he comes on is all the trips he was taking to New York yeah, and all the business uh, yeah. he was doing with well, the New York guys yeah, to get into their good graces and, yeah. and Boston. Yeah. Oh my God. We can be talking for weeks at a time, hours at a time. I, the stories will never end, but listen, everybody says smaller cities, it's a two hour ride to New York city. Yeah. I mean, so when you think about it, if the mafia, the biggest, uh, the five families exist in New York. It's a two hour ride. It, what is that? I mean, a two hour ride. I mean, most of the mafia guys, the mafia boss don't even live in New York. No, it's like in you know, Detroit, they live in New with- Jersey. They live, you yeah. know what I mean? So it's like, and Scott, you've been covering our area for a long time. And you know, we don't get what, what my thing is, is I always push it. Well, I'll tell you this real quick. I know you guys got to go, but Western mass, it's the same thing. It's mafia. It's mopped up. And there was some serious guys. Not only when I say Western mass, Connecticut, and Connecticut doesn't get justice. There was some notorious Billy Grasso. I put him up against any New York boss there was. Do research on Billy Grasso, Whitey Tropiano, and all those. Uh, you know, Nicky Bianco came up from the Columbos. He was. I mean, there was some notorious gangsters, and nobody gives them. Nobody gives them play because. Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York. Where are you going? It's New the York. same thing in Detroit, uh, Anthony. I mean, just watch the movie The Irishman. Uh, you know, the $200 million Netflix movie that you'd think they would have done their research on. They got De Niro, Pacino, uh, you know, everybody and their brother, and they're presenting the most powerful mobster to ever walk out of Detroit, Tony Giacalone. And they're portraying him in that movie as he's some type of water boy or, or some type of lackey. And it's like, just because it's Detroit, just because it's Springfield, doesn't mean it's not, you know, as real as cancer. And I know the Jackaloni family was very offended by that portrayal of Tony Jack in in the movie as some type of like he was there to just open doors for for Tony Provenzano. <laughs> and in reality, it was right. the it was the exact opposite. Tony Jack was calling right. calling the shots, and Tony Pro was following. Right. right. So, I mean, it's the same and thing. you know the history. So you, you kind of know, like, you know, based on what you cover, you know, with the big black mafia uh, organizations and similar Italian organizations in your area. And, um, you know, like, you know, people will say the same thing. You must you must hear this a lot. Like, oh, Detroit. Detroit wasn't shit. Right. Because they're Detroit. Yeah. Go to Detroit. And you know what? Say that to someone from Detroit. Same thing Detroit. about New York. No, but Detroit's probably say, fuck those idiots in New York. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know. 
it don't matter where you're from. Like I, I'm proud of where I'm from. I, I think our gangsters are the best. And, and, and I'm telling the story about our area because I think there was a lot of notorious and it's, let's just go like this. Let's talk about money. You know, that's what you should focus on more. Let's talk about money. There's how many, how many guys, you know, in New York, wise guys, they're broke. They ain't got two nickels together. Not anybody up here. Everyone was a multimillionaire. Yep. Multi, multi. Same, same in Detroit. Our mob bosses didn't die uh, gangster rich. They, they died Fortune 500 rich. I mean, Jack Toko, wow. uh, who was the godfather for, for 35 years, died in 2014. And I believe that, you know, he was worth uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, right. And I'm not taking any. Listen, New York is New York. I mean, it's tough living in New York with, with five families, one in New Jersey and everyone running around. I mean, it's like, you know, it's it's just. It's insane. You, you're always in competition. You know, someone's always with somebody. Oh, you can't talk to him because he's with me and I'm doing business with them. And you know, so it's just like so crazy. I get that. But uh, that's why I like if you ask me, I like I think our area is the best. Well, we'll definitely I mean, we're, we're going to have Anthony on back soon, but we'll definitely have him on when the podcast and the book come out. Uh, for him to promote it. I can't wait to get my hands on that manuscript uh, for his book by Mr. Bradley. I'm very eager to read it because, like I said, I mean, I, I don't know if there have been more intriguing, uh, suspenseful, compelling mob stories of the last 20 years uh, more than than Anthony Arlotta. So, Anthony, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we, we can't uh, right. tell you how much we appreciate you enough. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Uh, and I'll, yeah. for our audience, make sure uh, you follow Anthony on social media, but also our, uh, you know, subscribe to our uh, YouTube channel, please. And we're also on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. And, and we follow Anthony. He follows us. So uh, I encourage yeah. everyone to look at his stuff and please subscribe to ours as well. So yeah. we appreciate you uh, here at the OG podcast. We appreciate the audience. We're going to keep on giving you that great true crime content with a unique perspective, unique insight from people like Anthony Arlotta. Please like, subscribe, follow um, everything Original Gangsters podcast. Uh, you can get it, uh, obviously, wherever podcasts are consumed. Check us up on YouTube. We'll be back next week. Scott Bernstein for Jimmy Bucciolato and Ben Augusta. We are out. <laughs>